Hi everyone, uh, I thought I'd show you my latest project. This is a standard computer joystick. That's not that interesting, but this particular joystick is entirely optical. So there's no wires inside here. This is only glass fibers inside this cable, uh, meaning that the joystick has no electronics inside it. This part of it is completely free of electronics. Uh, why would you want that? You may want to put this joystick into an environment where you cannot have any uh, electricity for either safety reasons or in this case this joystick is going to be used inside MRI and MEG machines so you don't want wires in those environments because it might interfere with the magnetic field um, or may cause a safety issue in those environments so uh, I developed this joystick that is um, entirely metal free actually there's no all the fasteners are plastic and uh, as I mentioned the sensing method is entirely optical so this uh, cable contains a total of eight fibers and this is uh, an NPO, MPO connector, which is an industry standard for uh, multiple fiber optics in sort of one connector. So typically these have 12 fibers in them, as this one does, but I'm only using eight. And uh, it all snaps together like that. And I bought this pre-made cable which breaks out the eight uh, fibers into individual lines. And I'll show you inside this box so you can see where those fibers go. Here's all the electronics inside the interface box. Uh, I guess I'll start on the optical side. Over here we have uh, eight optical fibers. Four of them are transmitters and in this case the transmitters are just on all the time. It's not really sending any data. So there's just a couple of current limiting resistors and um, I think I set them to about 75 milliamps for each one of those transmitters. So it's a fair bit of power and I'll put up a link to the um, to the data sheet on these parts. Uh, so then we have the receivers over here. This company, Avago or Avago or whatever, makes a bunch of optical components and they make two versions of this receiver. Uh, this particular one has uh, a Schmidt trigger in there and it's meant for low speed da data communications. So the output swings from zero volts and then is supposed to snap very quickly up to five volts. Um, I found that they don't actually snap all that quickly if the input optical signal is kind of slowly changing you can get these uh, parts to not suddenly switch. But anyway what you essentially get is a square wave out of these that uh, tracks the input and it's it's set somewhat arbitrarily so when the input power goes over a certain threshold um, the signal out of these switches so what we have is four plain old square waves from these receivers and that gets fed into a chip also made by Avago and this is a set of counters and quadrature decoders so that as the signals uh, change in here the counters count up and down and uh, the reason I chose to use this chip is because you can clock it pretty quickly uh, over here I've got a 555 circuit running at about 100 kilohertz and so this uh, chip uses the 100 kilohertz clock signal to figure out the state transitions in the quadrature signals you could go much faster this chip can handle clock rates up to about 33 megahertz uh, however, I found if you clock it that fast, it will pick up noise and, uh, you know, tiny little twitches and stuff in these signals and it's, it's just not helpful. So by lowering the clock signal, you can actually make the system more noise resistant. And in, in this case, having a 100 kilohertz clock is plenty fast to, um, you know, capture the movement from the joystick. Okay, so once the counters in here are synced up with the movement of the joystick, uh, the Arduino samples the values from this chip. It reads them out in 8-bit uh, uh, segments. That's a 32-bit counter for each channel, so it reads out a bunch, but I think I only... I guess I'll put some more details of the Arduino code up, but I only, I only read the last two bytes because the, there's not enough travel, so I don't really need all 32 bits. Uh, and the main job that I was using the Arduino to do is to uh, keep track of the minimum and maximum and automatically scale the output. So one problem with uh, incremental encoders like this quadrature system is that 
uh, when you first power on the device, it doesn't know where the joystick is. So you can't have like an absolute number associated with it. So what the Arduino does is it captures the minimum and maximum position for a given session and then scales the output so that it's always outputting a percentage of that range. Uh, so this would require the user to move the joystick around into complete revolution right after powering up um, so that the device, so that the code in the Arduino knows what the minimum and maximum value is. And then from here I sent that scaled sort of uh, percentage range to this uh, AT Mega chip which does USB interfacing. So <laughs> I realize this is kind of a lot of chips. I, it would be actually much better just to have a single AT Mega chip read the quadrature signals and go all the way through to USB. But in the name of getting the circuit done quickly and easily, uh, I did it this way and, and kept the code pretty simple. Um, using modular components like this allows me to change things later on to rather than be dedicated to one specific AT Mega chip. Okay, so if we turn the joystick over, you can see how it's built inside, and we have the bundle of fiber optics coming in here and splitting off into the individual fibers. So two of the fibers uh, are positioned on one side of this encoder wheel, and two of the fibers are positioned on the other side, and they're set up so that the distance between the two fibers is um, a 90 degree phase difference in the pitch of the encoder wheel. So as the wheel spins, uh, the light is broken up in such a way that it's 90 degrees out of phase for the two channels. And then you have the same thing for the other axis. So and, uh, when I rotate the joystick handle, the uh, movement is you know, split up into vertical and horizontal rotation and that's what turns the encoder disks and sends the signal out the optical cable. I chose the, the core diameter, 62.5 micrometers, to be about the width of an encoding segment on one of these code wheels at the right uh, radius. So as the code wheel turns, it pretty much, at almost 100%, occludes the fiber end. And um, that works out pretty good because you get a nice strong uh, square wave signal out of the optical system. Uh, the, these are actually surprisingly tough. I wanted to show what you can get away with with one of these fibers. Um, it would seem that a glass fiber would be pretty delicate, but check out what you can do with one of these. You, know, you can really, I mean, you would never do this to, you would never be able to make it go this, and it's, it'll all just snap back. And you can even get a fair bit of signal. This doesn't attenuate the signal as much as you might think. So I'll just go ahead and break one just so you can see what it's going to take. It's actually pretty surprising how small the radius can get before it actually breaks. So if I push on this thing, still together, still together, <laughs> try to break it. And it finally snapped. But as you can see, you really have to try to break one of these. Now, when you strip the protective jacket off um, and expose just the glass fiber, then it gets quite fragile. Here's uh, one of these fiber stripping tools and so if I strip off that protective jacket you can just barely see it but um, there's the fiber itself. Now the thing is pretty delicate and uh, it, it, I just broke a piece off, even though it's impossible to see. And this is the part where you actually, uh, you know, insert the glass fiber into the into the ferrule like this. And I'll put a link to a video that shows how to do the termination there and polish the end.